Daniel Morgan Bush Ranger. Daniel Morgan, 30 April 1839, April 1865, was an Australian Bush Ranger. Morgan has been described as the most bloodthirsty ruffian that ever took to the bush in Australia, and one of the most determined and bloodthirsty of colonial freebooters. Many accounts of his activities, particularly in the years after his death, emphasize his brutality and erratic behavior, but Morgan had many sympathizers and informants in the districts where he carried out his activities. He was an expert bushman with superb horse-riding skills, a combination of abilities which enabled him to evade capture by the authorities for a significant period of time. After Morgan killed a police sergeant in June 1864, the government of New South Wales offered a £1,000 reward for his apprehension. He was shot and killed in April 1865, after holding up Peach Elba Station in Victoria. Morgan's exploits inspired the 1976 exploitation film Mad Dog Morgan, starring Dennis Hopper in the title role. Early Life Dan Morgan probably started life as John Owen, the illegitimate son of Mary Owen, and George Fuller, born at a pin, New South Wales, on 30 April 1830. His mother was locally known as the Gypsy, and George Fuller was a costermonger, a person who sells fruit and vegetables from a handcart in the street. Other sources claim Morgan's father was an ex-convict called Samuel Morin. From an early age, John Owen was raised by a man called John Roberts, known in the Campbelltown district as Jack the Welshman. Owen attended a Catholic school at Campbelltown, but was considered a inner do well. He was characterized as having antisocial tendencies, society had little charm for him, bush and solitude were his delight. First Conviction in about 1847, aged 17 years, Owen found employment as a stockman on a station in the Murrumbidge district. It was reputed that Owen developed into a horse and cattle stealer, his practice being to drive his captures long distances and sell them. By the early 1850s he was known as Bill the Native, and was described as a notorious horse thief in the Avoca district, where he lived a lonely life in the Mallee scrub which then abounded there. He had several narrow escapes from the squatters who frequently pursued him. On one occasion, he was being chased for several miles by two settlers and one of them shot him in the knee. In June 1854, Owen was convicted under the name John Smith of highway robbery. He had stuck up two traveling hawkers in the Castlemaine district in Victoria and left them tied up to trees. The police followed his tracks and captured him after a desperate resistance. As John Smith Morgan was sentenced to 12 years hard labor and eventually confined in the prison ship success lying offshore at Williamstown. While working at a quarry near where the success was berthed, Morgan lost the top of one of his fingers in an accident. The finger was jammed between a heavy bar and the stone they were lifting. On 27 March 1857, the Inspector General of Penal Establishments, John Price, was brutally murdered by a group of prisoners from the prison hulk success. Price had been standing on the tramway of the Bayside Quarry where the prisoners were working hearing complaints about rations when he was attacked. A number of the prisoners overpowered him and dragged him down the side of the earthwork opposite the bay, out of sight of the guard, felled him to the ground, and battered his head with large stones. Price later died of his injuries. Three of the prisoners were convicted of Price's murder, and were hanged for the crime. Morgan may have been considered to be amongst the group that had rushed at the inspector and was transferred to Pentridge Prison after the incident. In June 1860, Morgan was granted a ticket of leave for the Yakandanda district south of Albury. Morgan later claimed that he had gone to Yakandanda where he asked a man for a job, which was refused him on account of his having been at Pentridge and that he then determined never again to ask for employment.
After failing to report to the authorities, Morgan was proclaimed to be a prisoner of the Crown illegally at large. Almost immediately upon his release, Morgan entered upon a continual course of crime. Identified as Jack Down the River appropriate to his prisoner illegally at large status, he visited a pastoral run in the Murray district belonging to Dr. J. P. Rowe from which the doctor was absent and stole a gold watch. From there he proceeded to Evans Whitfield Station in the Upper King River Valley, 25 miles south of Wangaratta, where he stole a horse. After that, Jack stole a saddle and another horse from the Bonds Yupatipaton Station. From there he went to Mount Typo Station Messrs. Warren and Oak, where he obtained shelter for the night. In the morning, after the men had departed to round up stray cattle, Morgan helped himself to as much provisions and blankets he could carry. The squatters Evan Evans and Edmund Bond and a group of men set out in pursuit and at last discovered the gentlemen camped at the base of a steep range. Morgan managed to escape up the slope where the pursuers were unable to follow with their horses, but not before Bond succeeded in getting a shot at him, wounding him in his upper left arm. During the next few years, the outlaw kept a relatively low profile, supposedly engaged in horse and cattle stealing and occasionally engaged as a horse breaker in the eastern riverina and western slopes of New South Wales, and also northeastern Victoria. Bushranging activities. On 17 June 1863, Robert Morton, squatter from Wagga Wagga, and Morris Brack, a hawker from Beechworth, were camped at Walla Walla, about 30 miles from Albury. Two men rode up to the camp, one of them armed with a double-barreled gun and a revolver, and told them to bail up. The robbers took P.S. 30 worth of goods and money from Brack and four P.S.O. notes and some nuggets from Morton. When Morton was asked whether he had any connection with the hawker Brack, and he answered no, the money and nuggets were returned to him. This was going on John Manson of Beechworth, drove up, and the robbers stuck him up as well. One of the robbers was supposed to be a man named Morgan, alias Beardy, and it was reported that both men were splendidly mounted. The following day, on 18 June 1863, four young men were held up and robbed at Post's Cookendina Station, east of Henty. The robbers fitted the description of Morgan and his accomplice. The young men had been proceeding from Ten Mile Creek to attend some by races at Merritt's Cookendina Inn. They were robbed of three race horses, together with saddles and bridles, and fifteen shillings in cash. Morgan's companion in these crimes was variously known as Flash Clark or German Bill. On 29 July 1863, Jack Morgan and his companion arrived at Wallandool Station west of Henty and stuck up two overseers and tied them to trees. They then proceeded to the homestead and accosted the squatter Gilbank. Morgan and his accomplice then made a deliberate survey of the premises, and the result of their foray was that they rode clear off with two horses. Even at that stage Morgan's fatalistic attitude was evident. During the robbery he was reported to have said, I expect I'll be shortly taken, so I may as well go the whole hawk. The description of Morgan given to police after the Wallandule robbery was as follows, 35 years of age, 6 feet high, long black hair curly at the ends, bushy beard and moustache, brownish color, rather knock-kneed, nose wrinkled, but not pockmarked, had on check trousers too short for him. Both Morgan and Flash Clark wore hairy coats, and rode fine gray horses, and carried carbines in buckets. Morgan had been known by a bewildering variety of aliases during his life, including John Smith. By the time of his bushranging activities from mid-1863, the surname Morgan was the identifier most often used in colonial newspapers. Encounters with Baileys On 20 August 1863, the police magistrate of Wagga Wagga Henry Baileys was traveling to Urana on official business 
when he was stopped about midday by two rascals armed with double guns and revolvers, and ordered to surrender his money or his life. Bailey's responded by galloping away, but after a chase of several miles the bushrangers caught up with him. On discovering the identity of their captive, Morgan returned the money and watch he had taken from him. Instead of tying Bailey's to a tree, the bushrangers opted to cut down a telegraph pole, cutting direct communication between Urana and Wagga Wagga. When he arrived at Urana, Bailey's telegraphed Wagga Wagga via Melbourne and the police there, headed by sub-inspector Morrow, on the afternoon of 21 August 1863, a Mr. Scott was traveling with sheep near Bullenbaum when he was held up by two men and robbed of PS44s, four a watch, a ring, and a new saddle. The watch and ring were afterwards returned. The robbers were identified as the same men who had carried out the Wallandool robbery. On this occasion, Morgan was identified as Jack Morgan, alias Big Morgan. On Wednesday, August 26, the police contingent led by Henry Bailey's discovered Morgan's camp in dense scrub about seven miles from Urangaline Creek. Sub-Inspector Morrow, Trooper Brown, and Bailey's remained at the camp to await the bushrangers' return. It appears that Morgan had notice of the movements of the police, and after nightfall stalked the campsite for the purpose of surprising the police. Towards midnight, the police heard a noise in the scrub. Bailey's went to investigate, but had not advanced three yards before a discharge of firearms took place in front, close to his person, and he fell instantly. Trooper Brown returned fire in the direction of the flashes of the ruffians' guns, but the bushrangers escaped. Bailey's had received a bullet through his right breast, which exited from his left shoulder, leaving a fearful opening. The police magistrate eventually recovered, though he continued to suffer from the effects of the injury. The bullet that had passed through his body was later presented to Bailey's enclosed in a gold casket, which he wore suspended from his watch chain. In 1875, the colonial government presented Bailey's with a gold medal for his gallant and faithful service. On the day following the wounding of Bailey's, a shepherd named Haley, in the employment of Henry Osborne at Brookong Station, was fired upon and dangerously wounded by armed men. This incident was later included in a published list of crimes perpetrated by Daniel Morgan, in apparent retribution for the shepherd providing information to the police regarding the location of the bushrangers' camp. The events of the night of August 26 did not go well for the bushrangers. Flash Clark had been severely wounded in the exchange of gunfire and Morgan had to assist him to escape. He took Clark to an isolated location on Mahonga Station southeast of Urana where he died. A decomposed body was found on the run several years later, supposedly wearing the black coat Clark had worn on the night of the shooting. As a result of the wounding of Henry Bailey's, the New South Wales government offered a reward of P.S. 200 for any person who shall give such information as will lead to the apprehension of the offender. Bushranging Alone On the morning of 3 November 1863, Daniel Morgan, now operating alone, arrived at Gibson's Burrumbuttock Station, 34 miles northwest of Albury. The squatter, Thomas Gibson, was absent, but Morgan made himself comfortable in the house by ordering breakfast and sending one of the men to fetch up Mr. Gibson's favorite horse. Before leaving, he changed his clothes, putting on one of Gibson's suits. Riding Gibson's horse, he went to the public house at Piney Range, where he had drinks with some of the patrons before proceeding to the nearby Walbundry Station, where he stuck up Thomas Kidston, and stole a chestnut horse called Euclid. Morgan then proceeded to the Bulgandra station, another of Thomas Gibson's rungs, where Gibson was supervising the shearing. After announcing that he was now Mr. Gibson, Morgan ordered the shearers from the shed and told the overseer, Smith, to prepare for death, as he would not see the morrow's son. However, the overseer's wife pleaded with the bushranger, saying if he killed her husband, 
Her pleas were successful in saving her husband's life. Morgan then took Gibson into the house and made him sign nine checks of PS30 for each of the shearers, one of PS95 for Morgan himself and another for PS15 to pay a man to go to town and get them cashed. When the man returned with the money, Morgan departed. Early the following morning, Daniel Morgan called on the Stitt Brothers Walla Walla station and helped himself to various articles which struck his fancy. There he compelled the proprietor to bring rum to the woolshed and treated all the shearers. Morgan pointedly inquired about how the shearers were being treated and instructed them to acquaint him if they were ill-used, as he was always to be found thereabouts. Two days later, on November 6, Morgan visited Elizabeth Vincent's Mittagong station near the rock where he accosted Isaac Vincent, Elizabeth's son, and accused him of providing information to the police. Morgan instructed one of the shearers to tie Vincent to a fence post so he could enjoy the spectacle of the place being burnt down. One of the men was then ordered to set fire to the woolshed. Morgan himself then set fire to the station store. While the store was burning, he called to one of the men to get out a bag of flour, as he did not want to leave them starving. Morgan then rode away, commanding all at the station to remain in place till the following morning when he would return. Next morning, in accordance with his promise, he returned and inspected them as a general of division would. After eating breakfast at the station, Morgan departed. In January 1864, Thomas Henty's Arab entire horse was stolen in the night. Later, the superintendent of the station, Ingram, met Daniel Morgan near Cocardinia. Morgan accused Ingram of spreading a report that he had stolen the Arab horse and affected much virtuous indignation at the scandal. Morgan then stole Ingram's mount after which he informed the superintendent where Henty's Arab horse could be found. On 2 April 1864, Morgan stuck up the mail between Ten Mile Creek, Hallbrook, and Tumbarumba, and stole a horse from the mail contractor. Afterwards, it was reported he was seen enjoying himself at Ten Mile Creek without experiencing. Three days later, Morgan and another man stuck up two men named Elliot and Donnelly twenty miles from Narendra on the Geraldry Road. Morgan's companion, shorter in height with a sandy complexion, carried a double-barreled gun. The men were robbed of money, a horse, and a saddle and bridle. The men did not report the crime when they arrived at Geraldry, and it was only later, after a routine police inquiry, that a report was made. The reason given by one of the men for the reluctance to report the incident was fear of retribution. This incident is the first time Morgan was reported with an accomplice since the death of his companion Clark in August 1863. On the morning of 12 April 1864, Morgan called at William Haynes Geraldry Station near Geraldry Township and bailed up three men. Before departing that evening, he exchanged his black mare for a gray mare belonging to Haynes. A subsequent article in the Deniliquin Pastoral Times newspaper expressed disquiet at the delay in the provision of information about this incident to the police. It was thought the men involved feared retaliation by Morgan. The article concluded, it is clear that if this class of intimidated men is to increase largely, the capture of criminals will become indeed hopeless. Murder. On 2 June 1864, D. F. Johnston and two other men, while droving stock to Melbourne, were camped on Round Hill Station when they were bailed up by Daniel Morgan. He robbed Johnston of money and a gold watch, and afterwards selected a fine black mare. On 19 June 1864, Morgan arrived at Round Hill Station, east of Culcairn. Those present at the homestead were the superintendent Samuel Watson and his wife, the overseer McNeil, the cattle overseer John McLean, and the son of a neighboring squatter, John Hiriot. With a revolver in each hand, cocked and capped Morgan demanded that the liquor supplies, consisting of six bottles of gin, be produced. 
He insisted that his captives join him in drinking gin to an extent that all involved were probably inebriated. After ordering a meal be served to him, he rounded up the station personnel into a cattle shed. After inspecting the station horses, the bushranger mounted his horse to leave. At that point, the superintendent Watson rather rashly made a comment that Morgan's stirrup irons had been stolen. Morgan coolly turned round in his saddle, took deliberate aim at Mr. Watson's head, and fired. Watson put up his hand through which the ball passed, and then grazed his scalp. Watson ran behind the shed, and Morgan fired two more shots, one of which hit John Heriot's lower leg, shattering the bone in pieces. Suddenly taking pity on Heriot, the bushranger who seemed to act with the inconsistency of drunkenness, or of a murderer gone mad. At this time, two men made their appearance, evidently Morgan's men, one of them described as a half-caste aboriginal. Morgan supervised Heriot being made as comfortable as possible, at which point John McLean, seeing Morgan apparently relenting as if satiated with bloodshed, asked him if he might go for a doctor. The bush ranger answered yes, but soon afterwards had second thoughts. He set out to follow McLean along the road, overtook him five or six miles from the station, and without yea or nay coming close behind him shot him in the back above the hip. Morgan dismounted and lifted the mortally wounded man onto his horse and led him back to the station. Morgan and his men then remained carousing until two the next morning, when they departed as they came. The police under Superintendent McLeary arrived just five minutes after the bushrangers had left. John McLean remained at Round Hill, where he died of his wound on June 22. He was buried in the Albury Cemetery. Attacks against the police. On June 24, Sergeant David Maginity and Constable Charles Churchley encountered Morgan, about 15 miles east of Tumbarumba, while they were returning from Cape Bella Station on the old coach road. Seeing a man on a brown horse on the road ahead, Maginity had cantered forward to investigate. When the sergeant got closer, Morgan pulled his hand from his jacket and fired. Maginity's horse was startled by the sound of the shot and rushed into the thick scrub beside the road. Morgan's horse wheeled off in the opposite direction as Constable Churchley fired two shots from his revolver. Churchley claimed to have searched the thick scrubby country for signs of Maginity's whereabouts, but, as his horse was completely knocked up, Churchley revisited the scene of the encounter, but lost the tracks of Maginity's horse. On the road back to Tumbarumba, Churchley encountered Morgan, who galloped across the road about twenty yards ahead. The bushranger fired a shot which passed through the side of Churchley's coat. This encounter enabled Churchley to positively identify Morgan as the assailant. Near Glenroy Station, Churchley saw Morgan a third time and fired at him, though the distance was too great to have any effect. The next day, Churchley and three young volunteers set off from Tumbarumba in search of Maginity. That same morning, the mailman had discovered Maginity's body a little off the road about six miles from Capebella Station. After meeting the mailman on the road, Churchley proceeded to the location. Maginity's body was conveyed to Tumbarumba via Glenroy Station. Magisterial inquiry into the incident was held in the Tumbarumba courthouse several days later, with the events leading to Maginity's death based on the evidence of Constable Churchley's single eyewitness account. Sergeant David Maginity was about forty years of age and left a wife and four young children to mourn his loss. Based on his evidence at the magisterial inquiry, questions have been raised about Constable Churchley's role in the affray, leading to accusations of cowardice on his part. Three months after Maginity's death, Churchley was found to be absent from his post at Ten Mile Creek after he had visited a local hotel while he was supposed to be on guard duty. He was suspended and convicted of neglect of duty and fined P.S. 5. The location where the police sergeant was killed is known locally as Maginity's Gap.
As soon as the details of Sergeant Maginity's death became known, the New South Wales government offered a reward of £1,000 for such information as will lead to. The notification also detailed a reward of £100 for such information as will lead to the conviction of any person or persons for harboring, assisting, or maintaining the above-named offender. On July 3, the policemen, Sergeant Carroll and Constables Harrigan and Doubtseal, were riding through part of Charles Edgehill Station northwest of Henty when in the distance they caught sight of a man galloping away from an old hut occupied by the Corcoran family. This aroused the suspicions of the police, knowing Morgan was likely to be in the district. The police gave chase and engaged in an extended pursuit through the bush on the adjoining Wallandool station, during which Morgan's identity was confirmed. At one stage Carroll managed to fire his revolver at Morgan, but the bush ranger eventually escaped. The woman at Corcoran's had alleged ignorance of Morgan, stating the man that the police had seen leaving was a perfect stranger to them. On the night of 4 September 1864, four policemen from Albury, their tent had an open front before which a fire had been made. At about 9 o'clock the men were lying and resting on the ground inside the tent. Suddenly a simultaneous volley of bullets was fired into the tent, both from the opening and through the back. The policemen jumped to their feet and rushed outside. Smythe and Constable Connors returned fire into the darkness, and the firing continued on both sides. The others made a skirmish into the thick scrub, but without being able to come up to their cowardly assailants. On returning to the tent, the men found poor Smythe insensible and bleeding profusely with a bullet wound to his left shoulder. Smythe was taken to the station homestead, and next morning driven in a dog cart, towards Ten Mile Creek for medical assistance. After a dreadful trip during which the dog cart driver lost his way in the bush, Smythe arrived at Ten Mile Creek, after which he was transferred to Albury by easy stages. In Albury, the wounded senior Sergeant Smythe gave evidence that he believed Morgan had ascertained that he was on his track. Smythe thought there were at least three assailants. He said all the firing occupied only a few moments, and gives his companions credit for great courage and coolness. Despite Smythe's initial clarity of mind, in the end his wound proved to be fatal. On three occasions the wound had commenced bleeding afresh, and despite two doctors being in constant attendance on him, Thomas Smythe died on 29 September. Memorial Stone Honoring Senior Sergeant Thomas Smythe Five days after the attack on the policemen camped at Doodle Coma Morgan had another narrow escape from the authorities. A group of four policemen sighted Morgan in the distance on King's Run, adjoining Edge Hill's station. Sub-Inspector Zouch, who had the freshest horse, chased Morgan towards the Doodle Coma swamp during which the bushranger, being hard-pressed, threw his rifle into the scrub which proved to be the rifle he had taken from Maginity. Once again, however, Morgan eventually managed to escape. Morgan's business. In late October 1864, Morgan, in company with two or three mates, stuck up the Yarraby station, about 35 miles from Geraldry. The occupants of the station were held hostage until the early hours of the following morning. About three o'clock in the morning on 23 November 1864, the Deniliquin mail coach was stopped at the Turangelina Scrub, about 43 miles from Wagga Wagga, by Daniel Morgan and another offender, and robbed of the mail bags. The mailman attested that Morgan opened most of the letters and then returned them. Two of the passengers were robbed of two horses. On 11 December 1864, Morgan made an appearance at a road contractor's camp at Kayimba, 14 miles southwest of Tarcutta. He bailed up all the men at the camp, and when it was discovered the contractor Adams had no cash on hand, he set fire to the tents. He ordered five Chinese men described as miners to strip with a view to searching their garments. 
When they hesitated, perhaps not understanding his command, Morgan shot one of them in the arm just below the shoulder joint. The money he recovered was trifling one small gold piece, and about thirty shillings in silver the latter he threw away from his chagrin. He remained there until five in the afternoon, having caused tea to be made and a damper prepared for him. When Morgan left, he took several hostages with him, taking them over the mountains to eight miles north of Kayamba, at a location known as Kayamba Gap. There he held up two buggies, one belonging to Mr. Manson and his wife from Beechworth, and the other driven by two young men. After robbing the occupants, he then conversed freely for some hours, detailing his various exploits at great length, and dwelling particularly upon the murder of M. Ginnerty and Smythe, at which he made no attempt at concealment. He spoke of three men whom he was determined to shoot before retiring from business. The men named were Mr. M. Kenzie, late of Mundarlu, Mr. M. Lauren, of Yarra Yarra, and Sergeant Carroll, each of whom he expressed himself determined to revenge. After Manson and his wife were allowed to depart the mail coach to Albury arrived. Shortly afterwards, the mail coach coming from Albury arrived. Morgan ordered the driver to stop, but when this was not instantly complied with, he fired a shot at him to bring him to. He then made the driver hold the horses' heads while he ransacked the mails. Two days later, two hawkers named Knight and Shane were stuck up by Morgan near Pulatop Station, west of Kaimba, and robbed of paying a sixty worth of liquor and gold nuggets, as well as a horse, a saddle, and bridle. The hawkers had been well armed, and had openly stated that they were not the least frightened of Morgan. However, the bushranger had watched their campsite during the night and bailed them up in the morning as they unhobbled their horses. As he was leaving, Morgan told them he could have shot the two of them the night before and not to be so cocksure of their defense in future. On 9 March 1865, a shepherd, John Pender, was quietly feeding his dogs on Wallandool Station west of Henty when he received a shot in the thigh from Morgan's revolver. Pender crawled to his hut, followed by the bushranger. Morgan told him he had mistaken the shepherd for someone else. Pender later gave evidence against Michael and James Corcoran, who were charged with aiding Morgan in the murder of Senior Sergeant Smythe, as well as being involved in his own wounding. The Corcoran family had first come to the attention of the police when Morgan was spotted leaving their hut on Charles Edgehill Station near Henty in July 1864. On 23 March 1865, Morgan stuck up the mail between Wagga Wagga and Urana. He ransacked the bags and stole a number of letters. A week later, at two o'clock in the morning on March 30, Morgan stopped the mail coach from Albury on the road between Kaimba and Tarkata. He detained the coach for about two hours while he opened letters, but managed to find only a small amount of cash. Into Victoria. After the robbery of the Albury Mail Morgan was next observed about a week afterwards in the neighborhood of Tumbarumba. Late in the afternoon of 2 April 1865, Morgan made an appearance at Talangata Station about 24 miles southeast of Albury, from which many of the personnel were absent. The next morning, two horses were found to be missing from the stables, and it was supposed Morgan must have visited the place during the night. In late afternoon on April 5, Morgan arrived at McKinnon's Tonga Station on the Little River, about 25 miles from Yakandanda, and stuck up ten men, including McKinnon. When he departed, he took a man from Tonga with him to guide him across the country. Traveling at night, Morgan next appeared at Roper's Mullindolingong Station, about 15 miles to the southeast, where he compelled the services of another guide. From there, Morgan traveled to the southwest until he reached the King Valley, south of Wangaratta. By early morning before daybreak on April 6, Morgan arrived at the Evans Brothers Whitfield Station on the King River, about 25 miles south of Wangaratta. 
The bush ranger ignited one of the haystacks near the house which roused the station inhabitants from their sleep. They were gathered around in order to extinguish it. Morgan appeared from behind the kitchen, fired a gun, and ordered them to bail up. Morgan asked about the whereabouts of Evan Evans and was told he was away from home. Morgan explained he particularly wished to see him and Mr. Bond of Digamero Station, both of whom had pursued him in September 1860, from which incident he received a wound in his upper left arm. Morgan mentioned that New South Wales was getting too hot for him, and that the bloody detectives were walking about the country in the garb of peddlers. Before he departed, at about nine o'clock in the morning, Morgan ordered a female servant to bring him two bottles of brandy. After he departed, a lad was dispatched to Wangaratta to inform the authorities. The following morning, the bushranger appeared on an adjoining run, the property of Mr. McBean, where, in separate incidents, he robbed a hawker and three draymen. At dusk, Morgan arrived at the small township of Winton between Benalla and Glenrowan, southwest of Wangaratta, where he was recognized as he rode past Whitty's public house. During that night and the following Saturday morning, April 8, Morgan was in possession of the road between Benalla and Glenrowan. He stopped nearly everyone he met, riding up to where carriers were camped and forcing them to disgorge. Morgan's death. After his depredations on the road between Benalla and Glenrowan on the morning of 8 April 1865, Morgan left the main road, cutting across the country, the northwest where he reached Warby's Dairy Station, after which he proceeded to the head station Tamanick, about ten miles due west from Wangaratta. Mr. Warby was absent, but Morgan was said to have behaved politely towards Mrs. Warby. On taking his leave at about noon, he took a horse from the stables. By evening, Morgan had reached a road leading from a swamp past Rutherford and McPherson's Peach Elba Station, with frontages on the ovens and Murray Rivers, about twenty miles northwest of Wangaratta. Here, he met Mr. Telford and two other men and compelled them to accompany him to the Peach Elba homestead. In the week or so since Daniel Morgan had entered Victoria, he had traveled about two hundred miles in a wide arc around the population centers of Albury, Beechworth, and Wangaratta and he was now within seven miles of the Murray River. Morgan bailed up the co-owner of Peach Elba Station, Ewan MacPherson, and confined him, his wife and household staff, as well as Telford, and the other two men, in the parlor of the homestead. However, prior to being confined, one of the housemaids, Alice MacDonald, managed to get a message to one of the station hands that a stranger was in the house. The man ran to George Rutherford's house, located a quarter of a mile from MacPherson's house. Rutherford was co-owner of Peach Elba, and Morgan was possibly unaware of the other house on the station. Rutherford, not knowing that the stranger was Morgan, was in two minds about how to proceed. Meanwhile, the household nurse, Alice Keenan, obtained permission to leave the parlor on the pretext of caring for a sick child. She ran over to Rutherford's house and informed him that the stranger was Daniel Morgan. On this news, Rutherford dispatched a man to Wangaratta requesting assistance. Inside MacPherson's parlor, things were proceeding very quietly with Morgan chatting familiarly with the inmates. Early in the evening, he asked Miss Rutherford and Miss MacPherson to play the piano. Later, Morgan dozed in a chair with a revolver in one hand and another on the table in front of him, though Ewan MacPherson perceived that the bushranger was not actually sleeping. On receiving Rutherford's message, the police magistrate at Wangaretta gathered a group of townsmen to accompany Constables Evans and Laverton to Peach Elva Station, arriving at about two in the morning of Sunday, April 9. In the meantime, George Rutherford had collected together the trusted station hands and armed them with any weapons that could be gathered. He gave the best guns to John Wendland and a young man named McIntosh, who were considered to be the crack shots on the station. 
When the men arrived from Wanganella, it was decided to wait until Morgan made an appearance. The men were positioned behind the house and behind trees and fences in the vicinity. In the morning, Morgan went into a bedroom and spent some time in dressing his beard and long hair, which he arranged in four curls. Macpherson remarked that he seemed to bestow much care on it, to which Morgan answered that a man must have something to be proud of. After eating breakfast, Morgan told Macpherson be wished to borrow a horse. Fully armed, Morgan marched the men from the parlor onto the veranda and around the garden fence to the stockyard. When Morgan appeared, the men waiting in ambush cautiously moved towards him. Macpherson became aware of the planned ambush when he saw men cautiously following. At the haystack where several horses were feeding, Macpherson pointed out one of the animals to Morgan. This was happening John Wendlin had moved up to the garden fence a short distance ahead of the others. Without pausing, Wendlin raised his gun and fired, and the bushranger fell with a heavy thud to the earth. Two constables then rushed towards the wounded bushranger and disarmed him, upon which Morgan reproached them for firing without giving him a chance. Wendlin had shot the bushranger in the back near his shoulder blade, the bullet shattering the spine in its course and had made its exit by the throat. Gravely wounded, Morgan was taken to the woolshed. Detective William Mainwaring from Beechworth, who had arrived at Peachelva during the night, interviewed the dying bushranger and offered him some wine. The district coroner arrived from Wangaratta just after noon, but decided that medical assistance would be ineffective. At one stage, Morgan said his right hand was cold, and at his request, one of the men present in the woolshed rubbed it for him. Daniel Morgan died at about a quarter to two in the afternoon, aged 34 years. Mutilation and Burial By the time of Morgan's death at Peachelba in the early afternoon of April 9, a crowd of at least 50 onlookers had arrived at the station, most of them from Wangaratta. As soon as he died, several persons commenced cutting locks from his rather profuse head of hair, but Detective Mainwaring soon put a stop to this. While Morgan's body lay in the woolshed at Peach Elba, his body was photographed by two photographers, Henry Pohl of Chiltern and Mr. Hall of Beechworth. Pohl's two photographs were posed as though Morgan was holding his revolver, one of them including John Wendlin holding a rifle alongside the body. On the afternoon of the following day, Monday, April 10, an inquest regarding the death of Daniel Morgan was held at Wangaratta before a jury and the district coroner, Dr. W. Dobbin. During the inquest, John Wendlin, who had shot Morgan, was asked by the district coroner if he wished to say anything, but was cautioned that anything he did say might be used in evidence against him. The reason for the wariness was that, prior to the verdict of the inquest, Wendlin was technically liable to be prosecuted for the Bushranger's murder. The following verdict was arrived at the deceased, whom we believe to be Daniel Morgan, met his death from a gunshot wound inflicted by John Wendlin on the 9th of April, 1865, at Pechelba Station on the Ovens River, and we further consider that the homicide was justifiable, we further consider that great praise is due to all concerned in the capture of the deceased. The following day, April 11, Morgan's body, wrapped in a wool bale bag, was brought into Wangaratta and placed on public display in a police cell. Later that afternoon, the body was removed to a shed where Dr. Henry of Benalla flayed the beard and underlying skin from the corpse's face using a clasp knife provided by Francis Cobham, superintendent of police at Benalla. Also present were Dr. Dobbin, the district coroner, and Dr. Mackay of Tarawinji. Dr. Henry then severed Morgan's head from his trunk. The remaining hair was then shaved from the head, it was washed in hot water and a plaster cast made. In May 1865, it was reported 
that the Attorney General of Victoria had suspended both Dr. Dobbin for removing the head of Morgan and Superintendent Cobham for the part he took in reference to the beard, however both suspensions were only temporary. A later report states the skin and beard from Morgan's face was made into a tobacco pouch. On April 14, Morgan's head was put in a box and sent to Melbourne by coach where it was handed over to Professor Hafford of the Melbourne University for scientific study. After receiving the head, Hafford stated that he had expressed no wish that the remains of the wretched man should be so recklessly mangled, and that decomposition had set into so great an extent that for any scientific purposes the head is quite useless. The newspaper report added that the decapitation appears to have been a most unwarranted piece of officiousness and excess of authority on the part of the local coroner, and is very much akin to the prurient and brutal feeling which resulted in the hair, beard, and clothes of the deceased marauder being hawked about for the delectation of the curious. Daniel Morgan's headless body was placed in a pine coffin and buried in the Wangaratta Cemetery. Morgan was denied a Christian burial. His remains were interred in the Chinese section of the cemetery. A description of his grave published in 1878 noted that a rose bush and geranium were growing at the head of the grave, planted by Morgan's mother who, up until 1876, had traveled from New South Wales once every year to visit the grave. Aftermath in early May 1865, a man named Thomas Maslin was brought before the Wagania Police Court on a charge of using threatening language towards John Wendlin, widely known by then as the man who shot Morgan. Maslin, who had been drinking in the Union Hotel at Wagania, was reported to be threatening to shoot Wendlin. A police constable proceeded to the hotel and searched Maslin's swag, finding a double-barreled gun, as well as powder and caps. In one of Maslin's pockets, a small bottle of strychnine was also found. Maslin was from the Karoa district in New South Wales, and it was reported he was a mate of Morgan's. However, the police failed to produce evidence of an association with the bushranger, and the case was eventually dismissed. After his dismissal, a correspondent from Karo reported details of a conversation with Maslin, in which the writer questioned Maslin's sanity. The New South Wales government reward of P. Sown Thousand for the capture of the offender Morgan was shared between 17 different people. The main recipients were John Wendland, the man who shot the outlaw who received P. S. 300, Alice MacDonald, the housemaid who first conveyed the information about Morgan P.S. 250. What remained of the reward money was evenly split between 12 other volunteers and policemen who were involved in the confrontation at Peach Elva Station. In May and June 1865 notices were published, addressed to the squatters of Riverina and Victoria, calling for subscriptions towards a fund for the benefit of John Wamblin Sick, who shot Morgan the Bushranger. A statement by Ewan McPherson of Peach Elba Station explained that Wendlin had left the station at the recommendation of the police, who were concerned of the danger he was in of Morgan's friends avenging his death. Wendlin had been employed at Peach Elba for four years prior to Morgan's shooting. During April 1865, the New South Wales government passed legislation which was designed to facilitate the capture or killing of bushrangers and to punish those who assist, harbour, or provide sustenance to them. The legislation, called the Felons Apprehension Act, was specifically aimed at notorious bushrangers such as Daniel Morgan and Ben Hall and effectively gave the public license to shoot and kill such declared outlaws on sight without calling on them to surrender or requiring the commission of an offense. As it happened, Morgan was killed in Victoria at the time the legislation was passing through the New South Wales Parliament. However, the section of the Act dealing with those who would give shelter or sustenance to a declared outlaw had a deterrent and possibly salutary effect on Morgan's previous associates and sympathizers even though technically the act would not apply to them. 
In June 1865, Inspector Singleton from Albury stated that about 30 persons suspected of harboring Morgan and other similar characters have left their accustomed haunts and taken to honest pursuits since the Felons Apprehension Act became law. The epithet Mad Dog during his lifetime, the bushranger Daniel Morgan was described in many different ways in the colonial press, but Mad Dog was not one of them. The nearest association of the term with Morgan slight though it is was in an editorial in the Adelaide newspaper South Australian Register, written in April 1865 on the news of Morgan's death. The article compares Morgan, who seemed to commit murder because he enjoyed it, with other bushrangers such as Gilbert, Hall, and Dunn who only took life when driven to extremities, at which times they appear to have no more compunction in shooting a man than they would have in putting a bullet into a mad dog. As far as can be determined, the epithet mad dog was first applied to the bushranger in Philippe Morris' 1976 movie Mad Dog Morgan. A search for references to the phrase Mad Dog Morgan in the digitalized Australian newspapers on the Trove online database finds the earliest reference was in August 1975 in an article announcing that Dennis Hopper would be starring in a film about the Australian bushranger Dan Mad Dog Morgan. Cultural Influence The films Dan Morgan 1911 and Mad Dog Morgan 1976 are based on his life and death. Morgan also appeared as a character in the short-lived television series Wild Boys, played by Colin Friels. Morgan appears as a character in the play Humping the Blue Eye, or Ransom 1911. His life is fictionalized in Will Dyson's historical novel Red Morgan Rides 1940 and it is likely he was the inspiration for the villainous bushranger Dan Morin in Rolf Boldrud's novel Robbery Under Arms, first published in serial form in 1882. Two biographies have been written about Morgan, Margaret Carnegie's Morgan, The Bold Bushranger 1974, and Edgar F. Penzig's Morgan, The Murderer 1989. Banjo Patterson wrote, the words of waltzing Matilda, Australia's most famous folk song, to a tune played on the zither by the grown Christina Macpherson, who was the infant in the 1865 incident above. Morgan is referenced in the song Billabong Valley by Australian psychedelic rock group King Gizzard and the Lizard Wizard, released on their 2017 album, Flying Microtonal Banana.